个板。Um, all right, so it's uh, continuing on time. Uh, so we're on to our second talk of the day. Uh, now up we've got John. Uh, John is a game developer. He's going to be talking, however, not specifically about making games, but about making communities around games. So please uh, take it away, John. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, as Tim wonderfully introduced, uh, I'm John Mang. My Twitter username is Displaster. Please follow me there. Um, and I'm going to be talking about uh, how we built a community of game developers around a game development tool that releases open source. So the credential slide, I'm an author for uh, O'Reilly. I've written a whole bunch of books. Um, most recently, please buy Practical Artificial Intelligence with Swift. This talk is not about that, but it's worth looking at anyway. Um, I'm best known for uh, my work on a game called Night in the Woods, which came out in 2017. Thank you. Uh, and uh, people liked it. Um, and one of the things that uh, I did for Night in the Woods was I produced uh, a thing called Yarn Spinner. Yarn Spinner is the system that powers all of the dialogue in the game. Um, so Night in the Woods is a very dialogue-heavy game. Most of what you do involves talking to other characters, uh, and so uh, a really good, robust, solid uh, solution for managing game dialogue for that game was required. So Yarn Spinner uh, is a combination of like a node-based uh, dialogue tool combined with a scripting language that we invented. Um, so you can manage all the dialogue in the way that you flow through the conversations with characters in the game, um, and then zoom in on the individual nodes and write it in like a screenplay style format. The system was written uh, for the use of a single writer, in fact, uh, the lead writer of Night in the Woods, lead dialogue writer uh, Scott Benson, who was also the game's lead artist, didn't have time to also learn how to be a programmer as well and be a gameplay implementer. And so most of what uh, he did was he would go to literally a cafe and write on paper all the game's dialogue, then come home, transcribe it into, uh, into Yarn, uh, the language that Yarn Spinner uh, interprets and executes, and then um, uh, do whatever logic was needed to actually make that work in the context of the game. And it worked really, really well. Um, so Yarn Spinner, in addition to powering all the game's dialogue, also powers all the game's cutscenes. We released it as open source uh, in around 2015, I think, um, like two years before the release of Night in the Woods itself. Um, and uh, it, it's grown and grown and grown in terms of uh, community interest. So a couple of really cool games that have come out recently that use Yarn Spinner include uh, Frog Detective 2, The Case of the Invisible Wizard, uh, which is a beautiful little, little uh, fun game, and also A Short Hike, which is, I believe, up for some awards at the Independent Games Festival uh, this year at the Game Developers Conference. So. Night in the Woods uh, makes use of, uh, of Yarn Spinner uh, like this. It's running lines of dialogue, and then the player has the ability to choose between options based on what they select. Yarn Spinner will then jump you to different lines of dialogue, and uh, the whole thing works pretty seamlessly to, uh, uh, to the player. So this is the script powering the scene that you just saw, and you'll notice that there are some lines that you didn't see. Because the player in that video chose the line, um, I don't know, it ran the line uh, where Greg says, uh, I'll, I'll help you pick somewhere out. But if they'd chosen not long, going to move too, then another set of, uh, of, of lines could have been run. And at the end of that, uh, in addition to running lines of dialogue, it also manages the game's state. So at the bottom of the slide, you'll see a number of instructions telling the game to uh, modify variables, to perform actions in the scene, to unlock um, some art in uh, other parts of the game, and also to change scene to another part of the game as well. So today I'm going to be talking about how we built the community surrounding Yarn Spinner um, with a particular focus on how we communicate the open source nature of the project to a community of game developers who are not themselves open source developers. They're often uh, smaller uh, independent studios, solo developers, or larger studios as well. Um, I'll be talking about uh, what you should know when you're building a tool that's being used by uh, people who are not as familiar with open source methodologies and practices in the open source tradition uh, as people in this room might be. As well as that, we'll be talking about how to build a community in general for, uh, for when your users are developers. So let's take a look at how game development and open source kind of interact. So game developers have a very, very long tradition of sharing code, sharing anything with each other, because uh, a lot of people, especially younger developers these days, learned how to develop 
at all, how to program at all through an interest in making games. And so they hop onto YouTube, they hop onto forums, they hop onto uh, Discord usually uh, these days to find and share tips and code and art and everything they need to, to start making their own video games, with usually with either a, uh, a professional interest, they want to get into the games industry, or for a hobby interest, they want to be able to you know, make some art in the, in the form of a game. Now, this sharing is not based in the tradition of open source. When we think of open source sharing, we think of some fairly structured uh, ways of sharing. We think in terms of like, the popular licenses. We think in terms of, you know, oh, we have GitHub, and we have uh, Bitbucket, and we have these, these common places to go to share code, and the ways in which we share code, and we, ways in which we discuss that code. Game developers love to share as much as we do, and I don't mean to create a gulf between open source and game dev. There's a massive overlap, but uh, more often than not, I see a lot of game developers who simply uh, release code out into the wild, go, here it is, have some code, and they don't attach a license because they aren't aware of the need for a license. Um, I've often seen more than a few times uh, people declining to add a license because they believe that it will actually restrict what people can do with the code. You know, I'm not going to add a license. That'll just limit what you, what you can do. Mm. No, because when you attach a license, you're actually giving more freedom um, because by default everything is proprietary and locked down. Um, we often see people released with uh, no license or bad licenses. So, for example, um, a popular one in the game de dev circles is the WTFPL, the uh, uh, do what the fork you want with uh, license, which ha contains a single clause, which is you can do what the fork you like, um, which is legally ambiguous to say the least. And also we have code being released under, like, not uh, flippant licenses, but custom licenses, which can cause some problems when you want to integrate that code in other open source projects. For example, um, two days ago, uh, an amazing game by Terry Kavanagh called V was released. Um, the entire, oh, sorry, the game was released many years ago. The source code was released two days ago. And uh, V is a wonderful game. Strongly recommend that you check it out. It's a beautiful, punishing platformer. Uh, yeah, lots of love for V. The source code was released, and they said it's open source. But the license for these uh, source code actually contains clauses prohibiting uh, commercial use um, and requiring you to contact the developer if you want. And a number of clauses that uh, it, it appears to be like based on MIT, but with additional clauses on top, and that caused some uh, some rumblings from the open source community who said this isn't open source. And the conversation diverged into. Uh, away from, wow, that's amazing, thank you for sharing, into, you didn't do it the right way. And that kind of created a little bit of friction between uh, some communities. Um, but look at the code. It's really, really good that, uh, to see such a popular and wonderful game being, uh, having, having its source code made available. The other alternative uh, way in which people get their software in the game dev scene is very similar to how other uh, software uh, scenes work, and that is seat-based subscription model licensing of proprietary code. Um, so... Hopefully that's not like a, a, a astonishing thing to people. People uh, gen generally want to make money out of selling their code, and a popular way to do that is to sell licenses. Photoshop, Unity, um, uh, Houdini, most professional asset and co content generation tools are uh, delivered distributed in this way. What that means is that larger studios tend to be quite familiar with dealing with sales teams, but possibly less familiar with people with rando indie devs like me. It's, it also means that like, there's, an, there's a vocabulary of how we talk about software licensing. Uh, so it's not sufficient to say MIT license uh, to people who are brand new to open source. It's important to explain in some fairly clear and simple terms what people can and can't do. This is very similar to how Creative Commons uh, deals with their licenses. They have the actual license itself and then a human readable license that, that summarizes it. So that's the open sourcey part of it, but in addition to that, we also want to build a community around this code as well, and that requires marketing. So like any other product, open source projects have to be marketed if you want anyone to be using them at all. Now that marketing does not necessarily mean a significant ad spend, it just means you need to be aware of how you talk about your project to others. This involves figuring out what kind of audience is likely to be using your project and then figure out what they want and how to talk about your project to them in a way that aligns with what they want. 
So we did a bit of thinking about how yarn spinner is being used. A lot of people uh, discovered yarn spinner through its association with Night in the Woods. And so the audience kind of has a bit of an overlap. So people who are using yarn spinner tend to be uh, independent game developers who are probably hobbyists, possibly professionals. We are aware of some studios using yarn spinner, uh, and we love them for it. But usually it's, it's indie solos, that kind of stuff. Usually young adults, I'm guessing around 25. Um, probably English speaking, again, because of the audience of, of Night in the Woods, which was released primarily in, uh, in English. Uh, almost certainly on Twitter. Most game devs are on Twitter. Uh, it's very rare to see a uh, social network that has the same kind of population of, of game devs. And they probably learned how to code from YouTube. Right? So, so uh, that, that means not, uh, that uh, they are towards the younger end of, uh, of people. So that meant that uh, we had to figure out like, our branding. Um, we hired a really cool designer to make our awesome logo and also our color palette and also our font selection. So big shout out to Cecil Richard who made our amazing logo. Hire them, they're great. Once you have something that you can attach the project to visually and, and you use it everywhere and use it consistently, figure out how that brand is going to be deployed and be consistent with it, such as this slide deck. Um, we also figured out how we're going to deploy uh, Yarn Spinner in terms of its online presence. So there are five main pillars of Yarn Spinner's presence online. So GitHub, Twitter, Slack, the web, and also our live streams. So, the most important of these is, in fact, the Twitter presence, because uh, that's where people tend to be. It's where people spend their time. There is a really active game dev scene on Twitter, um, and that means there's lots of opportunity for discovery of Yarn Spinner on that platform. And also, because uh, all the developers have an existing presence on Twitter, we're able to leverage uh, that um, both to help build the audience and also the familiarity with how that platform works means that we're able to, to you know, speak the language and be aware of not just, like for example, the memes, but also just the phrasing and the tonality that people expect from Twitter. Now, we live in an age where um, Sunny Delight, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Sunny D, the orange juice brand, pretends to have depression. Um, the reason why people do this is because people want relatable, engaging personas from brands. This is an extreme case, uh, and no one actually really liked that, uh, 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 what uh, Sunny D and Moon Pie were doing here, where uh, Sunny D. Um, uh, basically acted like someone who was uh, going through a depressive episode and people began to push back on like, you know, you're a brand, you are not an individual here. Um, and so the account brand saying Bay gave a fairly succinct analysis. People crave authenticity and it's what they look for in their relationships and with their brands, which is why the Orange Juice account has depression now. And everyone likes it and it's good. So Twitter-based marketing does rely on some degree of personality. What you just saw was a fairly extreme case, and, and I recommend that you don't take it to that level. But at the same time, relatability is an important element of that. You don't need to be a brand saying bay, but creating some kind of persona for your Twitter presence does help you figure out how you can approach people. So. Um, these points here, by the way, are a big thanks to Harris Foster, who's the community designer for Finji, who is a studio uh, that published uh, Night in the Woods. People tend to engage with an online presence in the same way as that online presence acts and, and behaves. This is the reason why when a comedian posts a joke on Twitter, most of the people replying are people trying to make a joke back at them. Um, so the persona that you put out into the world from your social media presence does tend to attract similar kinds of, uh, of attitudes, which means that you need to consider how you want to tweet not just what you want to tweet. I saw someone taking a photo here, so I'm, if you want to grab that, I'll leave it on, on, on there. Cool. You're welcome. So with that in mind, we uh, designed how Jan Spinner's Twitter per, uh, persona uh, should be. Now, I'm not being extremely cynical with this, because uh, this is mostly me realizing how I present myself online, deciding what elements that I liked, and then tying that into what I expect people uh, who are going to be using Jan Spinner expect as well. So Jan Spinner's persona is enthusiastic, it's eager to share, it's a little bit self-deprecating, um, and also it's got a bit of the millennial uh, performative instant irony poisoning that afflicts everyone these days because it's 2020. Um, and also, uh, importantly, refers to itself in the first person. I don't want this to be, hey, Jan Spinner, we're here to help. It's Jan Spinner, hey, I want to help you out. And I make it pretty clear that it's a person behind this rather than, you know, I'm not trying to be Moon Pie saying I'm, I'm depressed. Sorry, excuse me, uh, Sunny D saying I'm depressed. But rather, it's, hi, I'm uh, not I'm Jan Spinner and identity, but hi, I'm going to help you use Jan Spinner. Um, 
with that in mind, uh, the actual stuff that we put out there via our social media presence is largely feature-related or what people are making. So we tweet about new features. We tweet about features that aren't new because people are going to be joining the, the, the conversation, as it were, uh, late in the game. We do retweet people who talk about Jan Spinner, but not too much because we don't want to be marketing to people who are already following us and saying, hey, have you heard of Jan Spinner? They have. We don't need to tell them that. What we do want to show them is look at this cool thing that someone made and boosting that small amount. We don't have a huge amount of reach, but that people do enjoy being part of that you know, whole experience of not just Jan Spinner as a, uh, as a project, but Jan Spinner as an overall thing. So we boost our fans. To that end, like any time, uh, well, not any time, but when people say, hey, I made this with Jan Spinner and it's great, I uh, retweet them, I boost them, and um, people, like, it helps people discover stuff. It's great. So images do grab more attention than text uh, in a wide variety of places, not just Twitter, but the problem is that Jan Spinner is largely text. So our solution has actually been to uh, post pictures of text um, and also screenshots of games that use Jan Spinner. Um, so to that end, uh, we have been doing some stuff like you know, writing a really pretty uh, syntax highlighter, which allows us to demonstrate language features uh, and uh, just really promote what is going on inside the Unspinner, what you can do with the Unspinner. Um, the web component of our presence online is the most serious business part of the project. Um, so we make sure that we aren't flippant or silly or too casual uh, there. If they're on the site, that means that they're there to learn. And so we try and be as comprehensive and straightforward. Like, this is Yarn Spinner. It does this thing. Go here to download it. Not, hey, kids, welcome to wacky Yarn Spinner fun time. Um, that's not what the, the web is about. We have a Slack uh, community, and that primarily exists to be the uh, direct point of contact that people can have with the developers. So um, uh, some kind of live chat system is really important to have for a community. We use Slack, uh, but uh, Discord is increasingly a popular option, especially for game developers, because game developers tend to be game players, and Discord is where the players are. So we use the Slack for community Q&A, tech support, announcement, and we primarily use that for uh, giving us direct access to users in, in, in uh, reverse as well. Um, any kind of chat-based space requires attention and moderation. It is work to run this kind of stuff. Uh, so it's important to promote friends and other trusted people to some kind of position of authority. Uh, it's also really important to be aware of the corrosive nature of people, uh, of toxic elements in the community. You should not be afraid to ban people from these communities um, because they are silencing people who are not toxic. Um, the GitHub is largely the central development hub. People go to the GitHub page for uh, downloads, to file bugs, and also to learn how to contribute. They're not really there to see the cool stuff that people are making with the Unspinner. This is more like the guts of the project itself. And so that, to that end, the README has been designed to be large about features and how to contribute. Um, this is not hugely game dev specific. There's not really much difference between uh, Jan Spinner's README and popular open source Readmes. But uh, we want to make sure that we aren't there to be, hey, fellow kids, on uh, on GitHub's README. For streaming, streaming is really important for, uh, for any kind of game dev related uh, thing because games are largely marketed through, uh, uh, through streams. So our streams tend to be fairly high energy opportunities for live Q&A uh, and for demos. Most people working in games these days like to learn via video at least partially. Uh, which means that uh, using streams is an excellent way to grow the audience. Uh, it also allows us to record the stream, and that gives us material to post to YouTube as well, which allows us to build just an archive of that good content. It's really important to be fairly consistent with how, you, uh, how often you are putting out uh, material. Consistent delivery of your, of your marketing is really important, and it's really important to never, ever go quiet. A lot of people feel like they don't have anything important to say, um, that's fine. Even if it's not brand new, you, you, can, you can put something out there. Find uh, a tip that you know about, and you, you as a developer, you're quite, like, it's integrated into your brain, and just put, uh, push it out there. That tweet from earlier of, hey, yarn tip, here's a language uh, syntax feature. Like, that's something that's fairly well known to most developers, but any time you put out a tip, you're teaching someone something new. If you have a monetization element to your project, um, never shy away from promoting that. Uh, it's important, uh, and it's important to realize what value that your, uh, that your project gives people, and people will not know that they can support you unless you tell them. So to that end, please back our Patreon. It's at patreon.com slash secret lab. So running the project is not 
terribly dissimilar from standard open source uh, procedures. We respond quite quickly, at least we aim to respond quite quickly to people who post issues and to people who give pull requests. We welcome new contributors quite quickly and uh, ask them to, and, sorry, and thank them for reporting bugs. Uh, and that helps them feel like a part of the project. We also give people admin access and give people responsibility. Uh, it can be quite tempting to try and hold on to the project because it's your baby and you know, there's a lot of your, your personal um, personality in, uh, in that. Um, try and avoid that kind of feeling. Don't be precious about it. Uh, we gave, for example, complete control over the web editor to uh, a person who'd made like five pull requests, and he's an amazing job. Uh, also, it's important to accept imperfect pull requests. Don't be waiting for uh, the perfect feature to come in. Accept it, and then you can make changes yourself. Uh, it's also really useful to flag certain bugs as low-hanging fruit. Don't be tempted to fix the easy bugs. Uh, your job as the lead developer is someone who knows a lot about the project and is in a position to solve the really hard ones. So if something easy comes in, flag it as low-hanging fruit and say, hey, this is a good first um, point of contact for people who want to con uh, contribute. So yeah, we found that to be really good for like, bringing more people in. Uh, you will get people who have tech uh, questions. Try and be as available as possible uh, because your users are going to have the best ideas for both feature requests but also help you realize bugs and features that you should have. So running this kind of thing is quite hard work, but it is incredibly rewarding, both in terms of the emotional side of it. You love to see people working on your stuff. Uh, in terms of the technical side, Jan Spinner is nowhere near as good without the support of the people who, who contribute code, and also financially, if that's important to you, it is for me, um, because you know, it helps uh, raise the people who could potentially uh, support you financially. So with that in mind, uh, go and make an awesome community, and I want to see what you make. Thanks. Um, so we've got a little bit of time for some questions. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, in regards to always being available to your users, I find that 99% of the requests I get are when I'm asleep because I live in Australia and no one else does. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Bring on people who are not in your time zone. So go, going back to, to, to that point of giving people responsibility, um, you will find it easier to have people who are um, as knowledgeable as you if they have been working along, alongside you on there. So if you're not at a point where that's possible yet in your project, just make that, make that information, the fact that you're not going to be available all the time, uh, quite easy to find. So when people come in and, say, and ask you questions, just say, hey, if I, I'm in Australia, or I'm in, I'm in this time zone, and so um, I, it'll take me some time. Um, like we, just this morning, we, we put out a, a post saying, hey, everyone, we're going to be less available for a week because we're LCA. Um, so just communicating your availability is really important. And can, it, like, you don't have to be on call, but being as available as you can, and that last part is important, as you can, is important. Cool. Any other questions? How much of your week do you dedicate to Yarn Spinner? How much of my... Your week. Of oh, my week? Um, yeah. in more and more every day. Um, so last week, we uh, basically the entire week was nothing but Yarn Spinner because we launched 1.0. Um, these days, it's about two full-time days a week, uh, and we want to increase that. That's made possible if we get more backers because that way we can put more of our time and we have to work less on client stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, right now it's about two days a week. Any other questions? No? Uh, well, uh, please join me in thanking John again.